classical antiquity, stars in the heavens were associated with the gods and with eternity, and therefore they feature in classical myth. In the Renaissance, there was a renewed interest among artists in depicting classical subject matter. It is therefore not surprising to find paintings that derive from classical myth and prominently feature stars. In Tintoretto's The Origin of the Milky Way, we witness the episode wherein Jupiter has given birth to a mortal son, Hercules, and wants to grant him immortality by having him drink the milk of his divine wife, Juno. She's asleep, and Jupiter brings the infant Hercules to her breast, and he starts suckling, and because he's a very vigorous and strong kid, she wakes up and is startled, and the milk sprays everywhere. Some of it sprays on the ground, and from it sprout the lilies of the field, and some of it sprays into the heavens and forms the Milky Way. Not surprisingly, Juno, the queen of the gods, is falling out of her bed in shock because she's been woken up by her philandering husband, Jupiter, who's arrived with a child that is not hers and is expecting her to suckle the child. But what's quite wonderful about the painting, other than that shocking story, is that this is a creation myth of sorts. And whilst we today think of the Milky Way as a galaxy with 200 to 400 billion stars in it, Tintoretto has chosen to represent it with less than a dozen. As always with Tintoretto, he goes for novelty, he goes for dynamism, he goes for fun, for entertainment value. And it has that beautiful juxtaposition of very sort of symbolically depicted yellow stars and then this stream of clouds in the back which look like the Milky Way the way we see it, which is sort of a misty trail across the heavens. It's full of objects that can be quite distracting, in fact, from the actual central point of the story. And I find that in looking at Tintoretto's Origin of the Milky Way, that the stars, which essentially take us right to the heart of this creation myth, may not, in fact, be a detail that you do pick up on for quite some time. My favourite painting in the whole National Gallery is Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne and in fact my favourite detail of that painting is the crown or circle of stars in the top left hand corner of the picture. The stars are depicted against a wonderful blue sky painted we know with lots of semi-precious ultramarine from lapis lazuli and the blue really provides the wonderful foil for the bright white stars. Not only is it a real constellation, the Corona Borealis or Northern Crown, but it's also the perfect narrative device for this particular story. In one version of the story, the wedding wreath worn by Ariadne is placed in the sky by Bacchus and becomes a constellation of which we know as the Corona Borealis. In another version of the story, Bacchus' proposal to Ariadne is that she join him in the heavens as an immortal, and therefore she is transformed into a constellation of eight stars. What I love is the sense of cinema or theatricality in the way that this artist has told this particular story. One of the big challenges for artists is how to convey something that takes place over time in a single image. And Titian does this brilliantly. Below Ariadne is the before, where her former lover, Theseus, departs from the island, leaving her alone there. And above her is the after, where we see the constellation of stars. The central scene in the painting is the moment of mutual cognition, the love at first sight 